good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the election day plus seven edition of Bull Sessions. My name is Mark Robertson, and I am man managing partner and founder of Manifest Investing. I'm joined here by my dear friend, Ken Kavula, from approximately 40 miles to the north of our residence. Good afternoon, Ken. Good afternoon, Mark. Uh, I've I've been talking to you a lot in the last three or four days, so uh, it doesn't feel like it's a new conversation, but that's okay. Yeah, we, we have to work on keeping them uh, discreet and separate and all that kind of stuff. I, I will tell you, Ken, that you, you made a remark the, the other day. While you and I were going through the small company list, you probably remember that meeting. Uh-huh. Uh, and we're just pounding away at the numbers and, and throwing around vernacular and all kinds of stuff. Alex was sitting on the couch. Alex is our 30-year-old son, for those who don't know Alex. Alex was sitting on the couch listening to this. And it was kind of like take your son to work day. And he just sat there. And when we got done, he just said, oh, my. <laughs> the, you know, the way, you, the way you guys throw that stuff around. And he says, you, you sounded like, you know, people from another planet communicating sometimes <laughs> with, with some of that jargon you were tossing around so a lot of good yeah. fun. we're also doing it's, it's a fine the financial language is uh they don't want you to know it that's just kind of the same way as medical language kind of is that way and that voice you're all hearing is kim butcher our retired nurse and uh, healthcare professional who comes to us from florida by way of indiana good afternoon good afternoon guys and, and we've expecting. been joined by our buddy from Pasadena. He's here, Mark. Uh, I just made him an organizer, and he just went green. So, uh, hi, Hugh. How are you doing? I'm good. I, I just got off a call. I feel bad. Today has been hectic. It's another, it's uh, another, you know. it's another full day. And, and if we've got, uh, we'll continue with the financial forensic stuff when we can, Hugh. Are yeah, you okay. are, are you still grounded in uh, California? We are, yeah. Okay. Much. I was out for a, a, a bit for the first time last week for a day, but that, that was it. Well, I feel like I should send you some kind of a gift card or something to, you know, in condolences because you probably miss your planes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm sure there's an audience. Some, some, of you, some of you, the audience already know this. Hugh actually keeps track of the planes he flies on the most. <laughs> yeah, I have a spreadsheet, so I know every aircraft, the tail number. How many times I've been on it, um, <laughs> and I've been watching them retire from the United Fleet. Some of my favorite planes have, have retired. One that I got to use an evacuation slide once at Newark Airport. I remember that. that best flight I was ever on. A lot of people were terrified, shaking away on the runway, but I wanted to get back on and do it again. <laughs> well, th those days will probably come again. So keep the faith. Oh, they will. All right, let me get the legal paperwork I, out of the way because we probably I, will talk about a real company in real time. No investment recommendation is intended. This is an educational demonstration for illustration purposes only. It's all about education. It's all about demonstrating, underlined, bolded, demonstrating the techniques, methods, beliefs, philosophies, et cetera, et cetera, of the modern investment club movement, whether it's as interpreted by Manifest Investing or promulgated by NAIC Better Investing. The views expressed here are our own. We might own things that we talk about. We try to remember to tell you if we do. Although for the life of me, it's like many of those regulations that don't make a lot of sense to me that, you know, who cares if I own a stock or not? Um, all right. I hope hopefully the SEC won't listen to the last part of that message, but disregard that everybody out there. We do do a I monthly wanna... webcast known as the Roundtable. If you'd like to be on a reminder list for the Roundtable, which is just simply the sharing of stock ideas, uh, last Tuesday of every month generally. Although, as Ken has reminded me, we did move the one in the proximity of Thanksgiving instead to December first. So the November Roundtable is actually you know, on December first. That email address, if you want to be on that reminder list, is nkabula1 at comcast.net. As always, if you have any follow-up issues or if you want copies of the slides, uh, I think 99% of you that are here in this room are Manifest Investing subscribers. So you already know that in the Manifest Investing Forum, 
within a few minutes of this presentation, the copies of the slides will be there. If for some reason you would just love to receive an email from me, send me an email, I'll send you the slides. It's that simple. All right. Mark, I wanna, I wanna tell a, a short 25 second uh, story about uh, Hugh, okay? Uh, our, two weeks ago, two weeks ago, our uh, bull session and our um, uh, round table were on the same night and Hugh made the statement that uh, we should be looking at oil stocks and we might look at uh, uh, a couple of the biotechs that were at Lowe's uh, and he thought they were excellent, excellent buys and we should look at them. So I, I brought that information to a, my investment club, which met the very next night. Uh, and some of the guys really were quite appreciative about hearing that. And within four or five days, uh, uh, one of the stocks, Biogenetic, uh, went up about $130 uh, on news that it it might have it might have discovered uh, a drug for uh, that had some kind of impact on Alzheimer's. And Hugh, you were just riding high. Your reputation was just as high as it could get, and people <laughs> were, were calling you all kinds of great names and everything. And and I was feeling as the disciple, I was feeling really good about. <laughs> transmitting that information. And what did it last, five days before the stock price crashed when the FDA decided that it really wasn't uh, something that would work very well in Alzheimer's? But yeah. uh, anyway, it's back down, folks. So if you if you grabbed it and went up 130, I hope you sold it real quick. <laughs> well, I think, I think what our review, time. Review, yeah. review committee um, talked it down, which often happens. Um, there's about a two to five percent chance the FDA will still approve it, and there isn't a good therapy for Alzheimer's right now. But uh, even if it shows efficacy against a small percent, and it doesn't have any uh, toxic downsides, there's a chance the FDA will say, "Well, let it go on the market." Physicians can decide if it's working and they'll continue the therapy. And the greatest thing about an Alzheimer's drug is, if they get one that works, it's going to be pretty clear that it's working. Because the people well, I... works on it remember to take it. Well, I just wanted to tell you that the Wolves Investment Club think you're just a genius at the moment. Now, I haven't had a chance to talk to a lot of them since it crashed, so I'll have to give you an update the next time uh, we meet together. Right. Well, start giving Mark a bit of credit. <laughs> yeah, at least get me in there to, to hedge a little bit if you need to. It just just to cap off what you guys are talking about, I, it's been my experience in the realm of investing that much like the end of the great movie Patton, um, there's a scene at the end of the movie where it's, they talk about the Roman conquerors being in chariots and followed by, a, a, I guess, a plebe or a young uh, uh, entrance to the fair. military that would whisper in their ear that all glory is fleeting. Yeah. <laughs> And I, I guess I, all investment I, yeah. returns can be fleeting too. All right. That, that story, that story uh, brings up thoughts of Miss Hearn, my world history teacher, uh, who was an archetypical uh, uh, little old spinster teacher in the in the mid '60s, who was a wonderful, wonderful teacher. Uh, I, I remember that story coming out of her lips a number of times about uh, staying staying humble and, and reminding yourself that you only knew something sometimes until you didn't know it. So Yeah, they're all great until they, they're not. All right, we've been doing this for several months. We are enjoying it. We hope you guys are enjoying it. Uh, we are going to continue down that bullpen queue of themes and topics. Some of these are on the hot plate for our webcast sessions from Wednesday through Friday. So something to, something else to be look forward to in in that content uh just a number of things going on that uh have been really great here over the last year or so even in a turbulent challenging market uh, we've certainly seen some uh, versions of success and uh the experience is a, is a really strong one and it really does come back to the discovery of excellent investment opportunities and uh, this community is really good at it. And uh, that's part of what we're gonna be celebrating. I'm stealing a little bit of thunder, Ken, but you, I'll let you take that one home here in a few minutes. 
So All right. We, These are the topics that we will be taking a look at uh, here in coming weeks. Looking forward to them. All right. As always, we do kind of like to start with a little bit of perspective. And uh, I'm going to whine a little bit here. I woke up with the need to help some people get redeployed into the into investing. They had actually sheltered a little bit prior to the election, despite my uh, sage advice that you don't really want to do that. So on Monday morning, I'm sitting there and I'm looking for some um, investments for them, uh, exchange traded funds, that type of stuff. And as I'm sitting there, I look over and I see the Dow is up nearly 2,000 points in the first five minutes of the day. And uh, uh, that was quite a sucker punch. I mean, not only that, all the work I had done for the last couple of hours was now meaningless because all of those return forecasts had been dented, in some cases dented pretty severely, as we had st some stocks going up uh, 30 40 percent in a matter of a few minutes other stocks like peloton and zoom video and others going down that much and uh kind of a wild day in the market it did kind of settle out by the end of the day so mutual funds weren't affected that much but it was a, a pretty wild thing and one of the things i uh there's a couple things here if you're not familiar with eddie elfenbein at crossing wall street up at the top i would encourage you to become familiar with eddie i think eddie is should be a honorary member of almost any investment club. He tends to follow and think about the same type of stocks that we do. And he actually went through a blow by blow of, you know, stocks like Clorox and Church and Dwight going down and Disney going up and the cruise lines going up. And, uh, you know, he basically did a blow by blow account. But the thing I want to take away from the moment, because I, I was pretty frustrated. Uh, I believe, Ken, we had a discussion shortly after all this happened. <laughs> yeah, you, you were you were extremely frustrated, Mark. I, I have never heard you so negative about an, an instance or an occurrence before. Well, well you, you know, Ken, you're, you're sitting there and, and basically Wendy and I are fully invested, right? We've got a little bit of cash on the side, but basically fully invested. So you're sitting there with this double feeling of, wow, you know, everything I own is hitting an all-time lifetime high. At the same time, these other people who skipped out of the market that I'm just trying to help are are basically getting left left in the dust, and it is just not a not a nice thing at all. But the thing to take away is even with that huge gain on whatever day that was, just a few days ago, I guess it was yesterday morning. Um, we're still only back where we already have been, and it's kind of easy to lose that perspective. And that chart kind of helps a little bit in that regard so you might want to take a look at that and then there's always this one and you guys know this one pretty much by heart by now the green bars are the stock market as represented by the value line arithmetic average and you can see that those green bars i mean just a few short months ago i i, can, I had discussions with people that said i'm not sure the green bar is ever going black back to the blue line which is simply a, a statistical or mathematical trend line through the data and I said, I'll take that bet. It's going to go back there. I don't know when. It's going to. It's going to go back there. Well, it did Monday morning. And we're ba basically back to the point where stocks truly are probably pretty much fairly valued. Is that pretty much aligned with your thinking, Ken? Well, I uh, I think they might even be a little bit overvalued uh, in a lot of cases, even, even now, Mark. Uh, and I just base it on the fact that it's still fairly difficult for me to find a company that I'm really interested in uh, that I think is selling at a price that gives me a, a real good bargain going forward. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a very difficult exercise coming up with stocks to recommend on these stock panels and on these uh, stock picking kind of things that we tend to do on a regular basis. So uh, I'm, I'm calling the market at best uh, fairly valued and maybe even a little bit overvalued right now. Yeah, and there's some indications that that could be the case, and there's some on the other side too. So it's kind of like, uh, like the current election situation. There's opinions on pretty much equally divided on both sides. How about uh, you, Hugh and Kim? Are you guys uh, going to have any trouble picking stocks for Friday? Well, this I is good. All, all I can I say think. is the one I picked already was up 8%, and I'm like, ah! <laughs> it was time for them to drop. 
Yeah, I think there probably is some room to the downside, especially short-term downside for many of these. But again, the takeaway is that, oh, and by the way, the, the value line forecast that's shown on this page, I think they're just having trouble keeping up. I think that that red ball is, is headed down um, probably very soon. All right, I thought we might spend some time just talking about this one. We have not looked at it in a while. I think it this is probably my slide for the week. Um, I think it explains what's going on. And it starts with the profitability uh, profile that you see up at the top of the page. Many of you are familiar with this. You have been watching as this thing has deteriorated and uh, declined. And in fact, at one point in time, not too long ago, uh, I don't know, Ken, do you remember how low did 2020 get? I'm pretty sure it got down. I I think it had gone sub six, Mark, but uh, mm -hmm. I know it was down around six. I think it might have even broken below six. So for everybody that hasn't seen this before, what this is is the approximately 1,400 traditional industrial companies, in other words, not the asset-based companies, the actual uh, net margin profit companies that you see here, about 1,400 of them going back to 2004. And what we had been watching is this steady decline of 2020, 21, 22, and 24. In fact, 2024 used to be up about here in terms of what was expected. And uh, I think a year ago, this one was up about here. That's all gone away. But as we were just saying, it's bounced off of some some really low expectations, expectations which had actually gotten lower than 2008. And now you basically have a situation where the economy has shown signs of stabilizing and recovering and perhaps heading back on, a, on an improvement trajectory. And that's kind of what's going on. I posted a statistic that I believe it was 89% of the S&P 500 companies outperformed what they were expected to do for the third quarter. Now, admittedly, some of those expectations were pretty harsh to the downside, but still, uh, it, it looks a lot like uh, many companies are, are managing through this challenge, and it's a massive challenge, actually fairly well. I think that's a pretty good entree into part of the price action on Monday had to do with an announcement on COVID. And I thought maybe we'd let Hugh kind of give us a little background, perhaps even taking us back to December, January, and uh, the wonderful global initiative that is, seems to be making some pretty good progress. Can you give us an up, update on the general vaccine situation, Hugh? It's moving forward at a surprising speed. I would not have expected someone to announce a vaccine with 90% efficacy in such a short period of time. And to me, it's, it's stunning, uh, almost surreal. Uh, I, I keep reminding people that if you look back at the Spanish flu of 1918, uh, a vaccine was available, but not until 1942, so 24 years. Uh, obviously, things can move faster today, but to get it out in less than a year, it's, it's stunning. And um, it looks like they will be able to get to manufacturing at least a smaller scale soon. And I know a lot of companies in the, that support pharmaceutical activities like the one that I'm in, a lot of those companies are given marching orders um, to start getting ready to help support activities with vaccinations on, on a wide scale, 300 million people in the US, probably a billion people in the Western world. It's a big order, you know, but uh, to do it, it'll involve a lot of moving parts. Ideally, I was thinking if they'd work towards a combo vaccine that was flu and COVID, that would solve a lot of the supply issues, but that's a hard thing to do. And I don't think it's, it's actually not possible given the nature of the vaccine that would be used for COVID that needs cold storage. But yeah, it's done it. And it, it I'm sorry. It's uh, future good news more credible. Guys, do any of you follow companies that um, we're kind of looking at that might supply uh, the equivalent of picks and shovels to gold miners, only do it for the vaccines? Uh, my wife has gotten interested recently in companies like Corning Glass and Thermo Fisher, uh, which supply uh, uh, different types of equipment that would be used in, in 
getting a vaccine ready to go for the entire globe. Is anybody following companies like that? And is that a, a useful place to look for investments at the moment? I think so. This is Hugh. I think so. I think the people that are going to have the biggest impact are people in cold storage and cold chain storage or, or related because they are going to put assets in the ground, um, a lot of assets. They're going to have the biggest increase percentage wise in terms of their assets. They might grow from, if they, if they have 10 units right now, whatever a unit is, it could jump to 100 within a year. So they're the ones in the short term at least that stand to, to jump. And anyone in the cold storage distribution chain, anyone supporting FedEx or UPS in uh, providing cold storage solutions to shipments. And and Hugh, just just to clarify, are we, are we not talking about dry ice type levels, therm temperature levels? Dry ice is something, but it's it, that's more of a uh, kind of a short term solution. These are, would be putting acids in the ground that would re would refrigerate down to minus seventy degrees and remain stable at minus 70 degrees, not requiring a lot of maintenance or activities to load it up with dry ice and, and risk that supply chain being a rate limiting factor. I guess the what other, about, go ahead, Kim. Uh, I guess, uh, my question would be is, as a nurse who would give the vaccine, syringes, needles, and alcohol pads. Yeah. They're the biggest, but I would imagine companies that are making those it might increase their business by 5%. People who are doing the picks and shovels, who are putting in refrigeration units into hospitals, their business will increase significantly. And it's a good question for you, Kim, in the hospital environments you've worked at. What is cold storage for drugs like there? Do you have vaults for cold storage or does it exist at all? Anything that we had to have cold storage on the floor was uh, kept in the we quote unquote med room that was kept in a Pixis that had to be cold. And then they started having pharmacies on each floor. So I don't know what they stored the cold items in. I might have to go visit my local hospital and go see if I can get some questions answered. Yeah. You often see regular type refrigerators used. Uh, but the type of cold storage that I'm talking about here would be um, would be very different from your household refrigerator. The reason Corning Glass is on uh, Natalie's list right now is that evidently we're going to need a different kind of glass for a lot of this uh, equipment uh, that doesn't get brittle at these uh, temperatures of negative 60, negative 70, negative 80 degrees. Uh, yep. And, and uh, that's... That's why I'm wondering if if we've even talked about uh, that kind of of equipment, you know. And I, I'm not necessarily talking about uh, a syringe like uh, Kim is talking about, but but rather the materials to make uh, these different pieces of equipment. And and then uh, she also is looking at companies to store it in, like you're talking about, you, yeah. Uh huh. Well, you guys are giving me all kinds of homework to try to try to pick something for Friday. I just, you know, this has been a huge issue for the last 15 years. Um, I get call, I've been getting, not recently, but calls in the past on a very regular basis. Can you store things for us at minus 70 degrees? Do you have that capacity? Are you going to add it? When can we have it? Interesting. Right, Do we guess, have any names of companies in that area right now, Hugh? I can look them up and see. I can think of some big guys, but I, I, it's the smaller ones that I think it'll have more of an impact on. Okay. I can look. At All right, it's that. a it, it's a great uh, homework uh, assignment for the next couple of days, Mark. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. Because it makes it does make a lot of sense, and I do like the the impact. You know, the relative impact that he was talking about for that type of thing. Anyhow, the third component on the slide, which kind of explains what's happening in the stock market, is that thing known as gridlock. And uh, investors in general uh, appear to expect that, uh, and again, I don't want to get political, just talking the reality of the way things work in the infrastructure known as the United States government. Um, it's, it's, now, it's now looking very probable that uh, the gridlock will be maintained which all that really means is that there's a check and balance on uh, any one aspect of the government 
operating uh, in an unusual manner versus the other. So, in, in fact, just yesterday, one of the prominent senators came out and basically promised that he would never cast the, the 50th vote to do things like packing courts or things of that order. So uh, Wall Street is basically signaling that they believe that will remain the case no matter what happens with the current uh, status of elections. Mark, for the next bull session, we're getting a, a number of people from our audience that would would like to uh, have you go back and grab a couple of these same slides from maybe a month and two months and three months ago, and then put them up in rapid succession to show what's what's been happening with this uh, this particular graph. I know we have this particular graph in a number of different iterations, just with different uh, dates on them. Absolutely, I'll go back and do that for next week's session. Yeah. I had thought about doing it for this one, but uh, it, 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 it definitely makes the point that recovery does seem to be a, a promising work in progress right now, you know, for the average company out there, certainly not true for everybody. Any other comments on, on this particular subject, guys? Because I think this is our, our, our core slide for the week, and I think we've already given the audience uh, uh, a pretty good well, basket of things to think about. Mark, I'll, I'll ask one more question on behalf of Cynthia, because I think it's a good question, and it's a question my wife and I had when we heard the announcement yesterday about the uh, efficacy of the Pfizer uh, vaccine. Uh, Hugh, is it possible for you to explain what that 90% number is actually talking about and how it's derived? Well, it's a clinical trial. Again, half the person the vaccine, half the placebo. And it, the, the results would, the results they reported would suggest that the people who received the vaccine, 90% of them did not get infected when exposed to the virus in the normal day-to-day -day life. Um, or they, they may have gotten infected, but they didn't get, they weren't symptomatic. And 10% were, they developed COVID, but 90% did not. Uh, compared to the uh, control group, which is people who took placebo. And how would that compare to other, other per, uh, efficacy rates, Hugh? Is that very, very high? Uh, very high, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And very, so when, for a novel vaccine. Normally, when vaccines have been around for a while, the African uh, polio, I mean, that protects everyone, right? But that vaccine has been around for a while and it's been protected and so forth. And this so is a novel technology as well. It's RNA. It's a completely different technology than has been used before. When, when Cynthia heard that it was based on only nine positives, uh, that probably was erroneous. It was based on the entire half of the total sample then. Is that correct, you? It would be based on the entire sample and they would run the statistics and then come up with the probability that you will be infected with coronavirus exposed if you're exposed to it. If you're in the control group, that is you just you're taking the placebo versus the active group, you've actually taken the vaccine. And you're okay. you've got to simplify it, you're nine times more likely to be protected, to take the vaccine than if you're not. And am I remembering right that that control group is something in the neighborhood of I'm not even going to guess the number. Anybody have an idea what the number of people in that in that uh, actual trial would be then at that level? I think it's in the thousands. I thought it was, I want to say 20,000. I would have to go and look that up. Okay, I, I, I had 30,000 in my head, but I don't know if that's yeah. anywhere near being correct. Okay. It's in that ballpark. I yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure West, Westbury from First Trust had it in that 30,000 area. I'll have to go back and look myself. Okay. It's interesting, my wife asked the same question about the 90% this morning. Interesting. Good stuff. And I, I guess one other area, I'm, I'm kind of stuck on this theme. And going back to what you've been telling us for the last six to nine months, Hugh, um, the, the progress that's been made on this as a model or, or uh, something that can be extrapolated, does it, does it have implications for cancer research or other other vaccine pursuits, even flu and common cold. Yeah, I'm not trying Certainly to put you on the spot. They are working on a universal vaccine for flu, but with, with this novel approach for RNA, I mean, 
the, the joke has been, you know, Star Trek in the future, they still have a cure for the common cold, etc. Coronavirus is responsible for about 40% of common cold varieties of coronavirus. So presumably, um, they could come up with a vaccine against coronavirus in general at some point in the future. This is now just specific to this one manifestation of coronavirus, and particularly the protein shield that it uses when it invades the body. That's the thing that the immune system will recognize and attack and neutralize. Mm -hmm. but, um, and for cancer, it's, it's a little bit different, but they have the research in autoimmune disease. One of the things about cancer cells is a cancer cell is your own cell. So it's wearing, if you like, a uniform that the immune system looks at and says, oh, wait, hold on, that's one of us. Let's leave it and let it do its work. There's no reason to kill it, right? That's the trick, tricky thing about cancer and other autoimmune disease is that the immune system just doesn't recognize the bad cell as being a, a bad cell. It just assumes it's a, a normal cell. Uh, but the, the body has the ability to attack those cells, um, but it has to be activated in some way. And that's what these autoimmune drugs are doing. They are coming up with a way that your body will produce the antibodies to attack cancer. And that, that is happening. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of people very optimistic about where it will lead. I'm one of those people. Neat stuff. And in, in fact, in discussion with some clients recently, I, I, I said you pretty much have to be have to have a portion of your investing portfolio, whether it's you know, through the investment club or whatever. One of my favorites has been over the years to watch the T. Rowe Price Health Sciences Fund, which is one of the best performing mutual funds uh, over the last 10, 20, 30 years. <laughs> I think having a position to be ready for the, the potential for some of this to happen makes a lot of sense too. There's that, but then you have to um, look at Gilead because there is foreshadowing in Gilead. Gilead worked, as many people did, on a cure for viral infection, specifically hepatitis C. Right. It was celebrated when it happened, right? But shortly after that, I think investors realized, well, hold on. If you're curing things and not treating them, that's actually a financial problem potentially because your patients are going away. Um, and so, you're, yes, you may get a big chunk of change for the drug initially, but you're not going to get that flow of cash that we're used to seeing for viral therapies, be it HIV or, or hepatitis C and so forth. So their stock price crashed as a result. Now, that actually hasn't slowed Gilead down. They, they're moving forward with hepatitis C to make sure they can wipe out all strains, and they're moving forward with HIV to try to come up with a cure. They realize financially it, it can damage the company in the sense that um, investors do not want to pay for a cure, they want to pay for a treatment. Or as patients want to pay for a cure, and they will, they're will they willing to pay for a treatment, they're willing to pay a lot for a treatment, because it's better than nothing, it's better than the alternative, which is often fatal, literally, but um, they would prefer a cure. And the other interesting thing is, in the minds of most of us, uh, a cure is communal property. So if there is a cure for a disease, and, and I would say an antibiotic is a cure for a disease, we do not want to pay for antibiotics. They're an incredible, they've done incredible things, antibiotics, but we don't want to pay for cures. We believe it's a communal property and it should be free because if you can save my life and you're not doing it, you're basically a murderer and no one wants to be a murderer. <clears throat> so we want that cure. And, and that's just, I think, a normal human reaction. So the caveat here is that when good announcements start happening in cancer, and I think it'll happen in three or four years, uh, be prepared to see stock prices take a bit of a wallop. Make, makes a lot of sense. I mean, I yeah. I sit here thinking about the treatments for uh, uh, diabetes, like Novo Nordisk, who makes the insulin stuff. I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. you cure, cure one and the other one takes a hit. So, yeah, I, I could see where you'd have to be hedged and or at least that very vigilant about the potential for that to happen. Yeah. Good stuff. All right, let's keep going. All right, here's your teaser. For those of you that are not familiar with what we did back in May, we held one of these multi-day webcast series known as COVID Cancellation One in tribute to the pandemic and the fact that we couldn't get together and meet. As part of that session, we did have a stock panel and uh, the, the 12 stock selections that were made 
are on the screen as to uh, how well they have done. Every single one of them has gained, and nine of the 12 have beat the market. The uh, average, on, and that's just a simple return, is 66% since May, uh, outperforming the Wilshire 5000 by uh, a whopping 38% since then. And uh, some really good stuff there, starting with Stone Co., which was presented by Pat Donnelly. That happens to be a restaurant software integrated platform where you basically order off of your phone. And it's a definitely a worthy study. I know Kim is taking a closer look at it right now. But from the top of that list to the bottom, all pretty good. Five below, by the way, was Nick Strategos. And, and uh, we lost Nick a few months ago. But five below continues to carry on his heritage. And uh, I did make a slightly controversial pick, actually two of them right there, Cars and Bud. Um, my my beer selection was was ridiculed, but I just simply just did, did a little more research and cried into my beer. No, um, <laughs> no that first trust Global Autos, that's basically all the car companies. And uh, if you actually go back and read a bunch of the stuff six months ago, it, again, it's, it, for me, it's an absolute lesson in, in uh when people tell you that the automotive world is dying and, and, and bursting into flames, that's a pretty good time to go shopping. And that, that one's worked out knocking on wood. We live in the, in Motown and my wife works for an automotive company. So we got to hope for the best there, but some pretty good performance top to bottom. And I do remember you, t you telling the story about what if cancer goes away, what happens with Aflac? I mean, that would be really something if they didn't have to uh, write uh, checks as fast as they statistically need to now. They're going to pay out a huge dividend because they're going to end up with a lot of cash and um, they won't have to pay it to um, their customers. So it will come to the shareholders. Good stuff. Any comments on any of those, Ken? Well, finish up the list, Mark. I really want to know who did, chose the rest of them. I don't remember Teradyne, although I think it's probably okay. Pat, I think it's probably Pat Donnelly. Oh, and by the way, we have a Pat Donnelly rule here that I did, have not mentioned yet. Um, What's that? The Pat Donnelly rule. Yeah. Well, what the rule has to do with a few years ago, Pat selected a company with the ticker symbol D E E R, Deer. Um, it was a Chinese company. And it, it went up like, I'm not kidding, 800% from the time of selection over a period of a couple of months. And then when we got together a year later, it was down 80% from the selection. <laughs> so there, that kind of fits with your story earlier, Ken, about being a genius, a temporary yeah. genius, right? Yeah, you're, you're a genius until you're not, right? <laughs> so, so we've got a rule. If Stone Company reaches a relative strength index of 80, and that's true for any of these, it's going to be sold. And uh, the gains protected, you know, very much like our work done in the better selling series that we've put on, because you know, again, that deer story is verbatim. That is, that's what happened. And Ken, you had a similar situation with Zag, I believe. Um, yeah, the, Zag went all over the place. Yeah. I, think, wasn't it? I didn't. All right. That's okay. All right, and I don't remember who did EPAM, but uh, my hunch is it's probably Sai. In, was in Immunogen yours, Hugh? Do you remember? Yep, I think so. Now, where's the ticker for that? It's IMGN. Yeah. IMGN. Yeah, that's an F body drug conjugate company in Cambridge that had its drug turned on by FDA, but not because it didn't work. It's just because the, um, well, they didn't have enough supporting data. It basically, didn't, it was a paperwork issue, I guess. So it'll come back. Does it have earnings? Oh no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you know, I want I want the audience to to look at the quality column, and you could pick out the Hugh McManus stock. It kind of sticks out like a sore thumb with that low quality rating, but he's he's betting on potential. All right, and I I think Ken, you may have had General Dynamics, and probably I, I know I had General Dynamics, and I think I probably had AbV too. It's well, been a favorite of mine for a while. So, I, I guess my advice to you is, 
you know, be patient. Even even I got above the Wilshire five thousand in this year's stock pickers contest. So <laughs> And Kim had Vectris is another one. Vectris was going extremely well for a while. And it's kind of it's kind of calmed down a little bit. Yeah, well, you know, 50-50, Chubb did great. Vectris did not. But wouldn't Vectris be involved in some of this uh, deployment stuff of the vaccine? Are they in, involved in that at all, Kim? Well, anything's possible. Everything I've been reading is you know, anything that's logistics. And if the, I guess it would be depending on whether or not the government determines that the military would be doing the distribution for the vaccines. Yeah, so they could they could be up to their neck in that uh, deployment. Interesting stuff. Anyhow, Mark. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to just going to urge the audience to tune in Friday and see what we come up now, because I think the homework assignment's pretty formidable for Friday, but uh, it'll be fun. Go ahead, Ken. Mark, Len is giving us some ideas uh, about this refrigeration stuff. Uh, okay. Uh, one idea is train, TT, and another idea is carrier, C-A-R-R. -R. Uh, and then he also is looking to Knight Swift uh, the, as a leader in refrigerated uh, trucking. Yeah, they came, I, I was thinking about them when, they, when you guys were talking. And night night transportation being one of our kind of a community favorite going back over the years. Good stuff. All right. Here's our reminder why we're doing COVID cancellation conference number two. This is from a year ago, Ken. Do you remember? Absolutely. Uh, this was in uh, Seattle when we were still meeting uh, face to face in large groups with no masks. Uh, had a great conference there. Natalie and I spent it extra week and then uh, met Mark for a couple of extra days. It had a really nice time out there. Uh, the Seattle folks are, are great uh, hosts and hostesses and we had uh, just one, one, just a fine conference. We, we taught a lot of things and it's the last time, in fact, I think, Mark, that we met in a large group face to face and taught. Yeah, I'd have to go back and look, but I think you're probably right. And I do want the, the audience to no, team and then came COVID. So, yeah. yeah. I do want the audience to notice that this is yet another Mark Robertson not pictured picture. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Did, did you take the picture, Mark? Is that it? <laughs> it, it could be. I, I, there could be a good reason for this one. So anyhow, that's the, that's the whole driver behind what you see on your screen now. Ken, you want to give them a quick rundown of what we're going to be doing? Yeah. Uh, our uh, classes start this coming Wednesday, tomorrow, uh, and this is at uh, uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, celebrating the stock pickers. We're going to look at contests, and we're going to look at how you might use contests to come up with really good ideas. Uh, we're going to talk maybe a little bit about uh, whether or not uh, over-managing a portfolio is something you really want to do. And we're going to talk about how many stocks you really need to to come up with a, a pretty nice uh, set of diverse stocks to make a, a little bit of money. So uh, that's uh, going to be a very interesting class. On Thursday, we're going to talk about uh, jumpstarting your portfolio with small companies. And we're going to introduce to you the entire small company list. We've given you folks at the bull session a sneak peek of the list but we're gonna introduce the list to a much larger audience. And then we're gonna talk about uh, some of those stocks in detail. We're gonna focus in on, uh, oh, maybe seven or eight of them and uh, give you an opinion and uh, talk a little bit about how they're different and a little bit about how they're the same as some other stocks that we've, we've dealt with before. Prove It To Me uh, is a discussion about this um, return on value that we've been looking at very carefully now for the last, oh, it has to be at least the last 18 months. Uh, Mark and I uh, spent another hour yesterday uh, talking about it in great detail, and we're going to go back all the way to the original definition and try to drive home exactly what this proof number is representing, and maybe even give you a couple of, of rules of thumb for when proof can be used even when you don't quite 
uh, have the gist of it yet, how you can use it to give yourself a, a leg up uh, on some other analysis that you might do. Uh, Sai is going to talk about resources for verifying and validating stock studies. Sai Lynch, our friend from Atlanta, uh, is going to bring in some sources that aren't regularly used and then help you come up with the idea that, first of all, sources are different. Uh, that's uh, certainly not something that most of you need to be reminded of. But he's also going to show how they can be used to really validate uh, the analysis that you do on Better Investing's primary tool, the Stock Selection Guide. And then, of course, our panel ends the session on uh, Friday, our Let's Talk Stock panel. And we'll have uh, six or seven people there. Uh, one of our friends that's supposed to be on the panel, uh, his wife fell. Uh, he did a lot of damage to her hip that had just been replaced and uh, is in the hospital. And that's Herb Lemkul, and Herb might very well be picking his wife up at the exact time that we're presenting the stock panel. So I'm not going to guarantee that Herb will be there, but Kim will be there, Hugh will be there, Cy will be there, Mark will be there, I'll be there, and our friend Pat Donnelly uh, will be there as well. We'll do some Let's Talk Stocks panel. We'll each have a primary idea, and then we'll go through a lightning round at the very end with just a minute or two on a secondary idea that might be interesting as well. If you haven't registered uh, at this point, uh, drop me an email. I'll be glad to send you uh, registration links or go to Manifest Investing where you can find the registration links under events or go to the Mid Michigan part of the Better Investing webpage, uh, look for chapters, <laughs> the state of Michigan and then mid-Michigan. And once you get there, click on events. In all of those places, you can find the links for registration. And we'd love to have you appear. It looks like we're going to have a real nice audience uh, on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And uh, if you have the time, come and join us. If not, we're going to post everything on YouTube. And it should all be there by Saturday or Sunday or Monday at the latest. Mark, back to you. All right. Thanks, Ken. So we go ahead and close down. We've got uh, five minutes or so and talk a little bit about our bullish library. These are books that we all like to just simply share, books that have been informative, instructive, or inspirational to us. And it can fit any of those bills. Um, and I'm always impressed by the diversity of uh books that have affected all of us here it's just another tribute to uh, a broad spectrum of diversity i think we'll start with this one uh this one has been i think on all of our lists at some point but if we don't have it on the list yet one up on wall street and uh in fact hugh and ken and i all had targeted this one for this week so i'll just open up by saying yeah, it, it definitely influenced me. It was from the mid-1990s or late 1990s, and Peter Lynch had recently run up that 13-year track record running the Fidelity Magellan Mutual Fund. The thing that I had forgotten a little bit about, and maybe Hugh can take it from here or Ken, is the amount of emphasis that he puts on studying non-core companies in that book. And the non-core companies are featured right there in the definition or the the biography of the book, cyclicals, turnarounds, fast-growing companies um, could could include uh, short track record emerging companies on that list also. And I'd forgotten that he did quite a bit of it in that book. And I, I actually made a promise to myself I'm going to go back and take another look. What are your guys' thoughts on this one? Yeah, it's well, definitely worth book to reread it, even if you've read it before. But for me, it was more like a confidence builder that you could do it. I mean, I'd read a lot of other books before that, but this was a confidence booster. Here you had somebody who was a professional in the field, basically saying, guys, I know I'm number one in the field, but you actually don't need me, and, and you can do better. And you can do better if you look at things that you know, companies that you know, which may be non-core, but you have an insight into how your particular industry works that others lack. Why don't you just exploit that? 
know. What's nice but about the book also is that he's not a bad writer. Uh, yeah. He's he's easy to read and he's fairly easily understandable. Uh, very seldom did I ever find myself having to go back and reread a paragraph or reread a chapter. Uh, if you if you stop and think about a lot of the profound things he's saying, uh, he, he phrases it in a way that's that's fairly understandable. Mark, to answer your question, I think that last paragraph on there, especially with the words that are underlined, uh, makes a lot of sense when you're dealing with these cyclicals and turnarounds and fast growing companies. I, I really like, I know that's not Lynch writing, that's somebody else writing the, the introduction to the book but or a review of the book, but I think that's a, a really good beginning there as long as you invest for the long term. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I include, again, it's, it's a name dropping moment, but I got to spend time with him face to face at the 1998 National Convention out in San Jose, California. And uh, he he's as down home in person as he is in, you know, the things that you see and hear and read about him. It's, uh, it was just a really good, good time. Very, very enriching and a good time. And I, I remember a jaw-dropping moment, at least for me. He was asked the question, how many companies do you need in your portfolio? Obviously, people were, what is the secret to diversification, et cetera? Right. And his response was, one, perhaps two. And then he explained why. And basically, he had the caveat, but if it is one, make sure it's the right company. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Make sure it's a really good one. <laughs> yeah. Only buy the ones that go up if you're going to do that. <laughs> All right. Well, Kim brought one that I have not read. Why don't you share your thoughts on this one, Kim? Um, I found this book. Uh, I happened to go to Twitter and I read some. Uh, I have some people that I follow, and this book was recommended. And truly, if you have anyone in your family who wants to get started in investing, this is a great book to start off with. But the other thing which is so good about it, it has, it goes into a lot of other detail because it talks about beginners and just learning and trying to get through as Buffett or as Munger calls the lattice work of metal models. But it also talks about as you're investing, how humility is the gateway to attaining wisdom and living a life according to your inner scorecard using a checklist why journaling and this is one i had a hard time with myself of why did you make that decision to buy the stock what were your metrics you used and then you can go back and find out if you were successful what worked and if you weren't successful what didn't work as well as you know they do have a section on there talking about special situations and studying spinoffs they talk about portfolio management and position sizing and how to make decisions and how to make better decisions pattern recognition opportunity cost because i never thought about it that you have an opportunity cost when you buy something and actually you have a cost if you sell something and you've chosen to sell it and it still goes up it kind of covers everything a to z i thought it was very insightful it's one of those books i think i'll want to reread every year and i think it would be great for somebody to get them started in investing where you've talked some of the subjects with them and you know what's going on and it's had outstanding reviews so i thoroughly enjoyed this book well cool well it's in my stack to read kim thanks to you so it will be done fairly soon ken did you have a thought on that uh no but i wrote the i jotted it down it sounds like the kind of thing that i might like to read it's uh I like to read things that that go beyond investing a lot of times. That sounds like this what what this does. So mm -hmm. I think I'll give it a try. And and having experienced opportunity cost on Monday morning, as Ken was sharing with you guys earlier, I I was frustrated. Opportunity cost is real. All right, our last book for this week uh, is really a page burner, a page turner. It's the, the, the evaluation of common stocks. Now, doesn't that just just grab you at your heartstrings and you just can't wait to get 
get a hand on me, this one. This is written by the founder of Value Line. His name is Arnold Bernard, and uh, it, it it really is pretty good. Uh, it was recommended by Ted Brooks a few years ago. In fact, I was surprised that it was six years ago, a little over six years ago. Um, written back in 1958, uh, it's just ch chock full of uh, wisdom, wisdom about investing, the way we think about investing. Maybe with a slightly different slant where they spend a little more time on cash flow, a subject that we're going to cover here in a little bit greater detail. Um, probably the thing, and you've seen us celebrate this, in fact, with the two links down at the bottom, especially that first one. Uh, again, 1958, that was an awesome year for people to be born. Like, you you can't believe how awesome 1958 was for people to be born. Um, oh, I understand that. <laughs> There's a hint in there. In fact, November 1958 was was especially good. Um, cuz that's that's when my parents discovered me. Um No, the really cool thing about this book is he talks about quality. Doesn't necessarily give it that doesn't use the same type of phraseology or whatever, but in this book he picks a dozen companies. And uh in that first article that's featured right here, you can go read all about it. Um, those dozen companies continued to uh, not only survive, but thrive until this year. And the first fatality to that list of 12 companies came just this year. Any guesses on what company of those original 12 faded into oblivion, or at least in the process of fading into oblivion just this year? Anybody know? How about Sears? No, but that's really, 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 really close. Well, J.C. Penny then. It is J.C. Penny. J.C. Penny. In fact, I had written about it two or three years ago, and speculated that J.C. Penny was on the verge of being the first failure on this list of twelve quality companies. It's really, it's a good read when you go back and look at these and see how well. The, uh, the nutshell version of those 11 survivors have beaten the market by four or five percentage points since 1958. And they, again, it comes all the way back full circle to discover an excellent company, buy it when it's on sale, hold it for as long as it makes sense to do so. And that that's basically what we are all about. It's a good book. Remember to uh, recommend to your friends to this is a place where we archive all of this stuff, including the bull sessions, the round tables, and some of the educational moments that we put together. Subscribe so you get automatic reminders and like the things that you like. And there's our bull jumping over the moon for the blue October moon. And just a reminder that in the slides to today's session, the 20 best companies for 2021 are listed here in the slides for today's show. And then there are some slides you can do a little prep work for projected return on value. So with that, Ken, any closing thoughts? Uh, no, I'm just looking at the questions and we have a few we can cover after we close down, Mark, but for the most part, thank you for coming folks. Uh, and if you have a chance to come join us at any of the, the classes tomorrow, Thursday or Friday, please, uh, it's free and we'd, we'd be glad to have you. All right, take care everybody, good hunting. If you've got oh any, any great ideas for me to present on Friday, send them to me privately so I can take credit for them. Take it easy.